and joining us now to talk about the trouble with transparency, Professor Lawrence Lessig from Harvard University, and he joins us on the line in Boston. How are you tonight, Professor Lessig? I'm very well. Thank you very much. Let's do a little background here before we get into some of the meatier issues. What exactly is the transparency movement? Well, there's a big movement around the world, but especially here in the United States now, to use the extraordinary power of the Internet to uh, take government data and make it accessible in all sorts of ways for people to do all sorts of important analyses about what the government is doing or who's influencing whom inside of the legislature. And how many years back does the, do these efforts go? Well, in some sense, since the beginning of requirements of disclosure about campaign contributions, it's been around for more than a century. Uh, but what's new about this is because of digital technologies, we can make these data accessible in a way never imagined before, so that all sorts of uses are possible to figure out who's influencing whom that never would have happened before. And how successful do you think these efforts have been so far? Well, it's just beginning in, in earnest. But what is developing is this extraordinarily powerful technology to make it easy to identify every single influence that might have gone into a particular member's decision to vote one way or another. So the fact that he met with somebody, the fact that he received a contribution from somebody, the fact that his party received a significant contribution, all of these are now accessible in a way that makes it very easy to draw inferences, if that's the kind of inference you want to draw. Okay, and, and again, just to clarify, what's your involvement with the movement? Well, I've been an advisor on the uh, Sunlight Foundation's advisory board, and I'm actually on the board of one of the companies. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization, maplight.org, that's in the business of making as transparent as we can the relationship between contributions and actions by members in the government. And the Sunlight Foundation is? The Sunlight Foundation is a nonprofit organization that was set up for the purpose of uh, creating um, opportunities for all sorts of different kinds of transparency projects to get going. So they've been funding projects to look into different ways of spreading government data, to make government data more accessible, to uh, create incentives for people to track down government um, uh, influence in a much more uh, uh, comprehensive way. So they're in the business of adding sunlight into government. Okay, all of that leads us to your piece in the New Republic, which I know the headline of which caught a lot of people off guard. The headline was, Against Transparency. Essentially, you're criticizing the movement. What led you to write that piece? Right, so against transparency, you could take that as, as meaning why I'm against transparency. But what it means is the arguments against transparency. And uh, what, what has concerned me is that there's a particular way in which these data get used that um, uh, increasingly develop a deep cynicism in how our government functions. Now, I don't think we should therefore give up transparency. Indeed, the article says the overwhelming number of uses of transparency are undoubtedly good, and even where there's some question about their uses, we're not going to give it up. Instead, what I'm arguing is that we have to tie the transparency movement in the United States to a movement to get rid of the underlying influences that make people so cynical. So in my view, public funding of uh, uh, public elections is an essential part of making it so that nobody can believe that money bought results the way 90 percent of Americans believe it right now. Instead, they could uh, begin to focus on why one result was the way they wanted or not the way they wanted, unrelated to the money. And, and so my concern is transparency alone is not enough. We need transparency plus fundamental change in the way elections get funded in the United States. I appreciate you're making the distinction in the interpretation of the headline, but people obviously, many people I, I think were kind of taken aback by it. What kind of reaction did you get? Well, in one sense, um, the reaction to the article was a demonstration of, of one of its points. So one of the, argument, one of the arguments in the, in the article, and it's, in, you know, it's an incredibly long, typical for a lawyer, 6,000 word article. Um, but one of the points in the art article was that there's this phenomenon we can think of it as the attention span problem, which is imagine something takes 30 seconds to understand, but you only give it five seconds to understand it. Or the rational person would only give it five seconds to understand it. 
What we know from that is that, that we can predict people will misunderstand the point because they don't give it enough time, even rationally give it enough time to understand it. That's, in a sense, I think what's happened, at least in many of the comments that I've read to my article, with my article. Because you read just the headline, you read just the first couple pages, you think you know what the point is. Uh, and you think the point is that I'm arguing that we ought to eliminate transparency. But that's nowhere at all in my article. It's just the misinterpretation that comes from this uh, attention span problem. And so one of the reasons that I think that transparency creates some of the problems is the same point, the, in the uh, attention span problem. To really understand what a congressperson is doing, given he received a certain amount of money, you'd have to pay a significant amount of attention to the issue. But most people, it doesn't make sense for most people to pay attention to it, so they misunderstand it. Well, let's so pay a people, little, forgive me, let's pay a little attention to one of those issues right now. And I know the Sunlight Foundation uh, had some things to say about the punch clock campaign, whereby I gather the schedules of members of the House of Representatives were going to be posted on the internet so voters could, in fact, see who their representatives were meeting with and when and so on. Um, what do you think of that campaign? Well, I, I think it's unavoidable that we begin to learn this kind of stuff. But what I thought was there are many uh, examples of congressmen meeting with people um, that would be misinterpreted. Um, so, you know, if my congressman met with somebody who, with whom I have fundamental disagreements with, uh, my own view is that's a good thing. He should understand the view of the other side. But other people could say, oh, see, he's associating with that person, and therefore he's got some tie to that person, and therefore I shouldn't like the congressman. Um, and I could understand that many congressmen would say, hey, you know, this is just, I, I don't have time to be fighting all these little misinterpretations or misunderstandings about what I'm doing, uh, and, uh, and therefore I, didn't, I don't want to make this, uh, I don't want to make this public. Um, uh, so this was just an example for me of how it wasn't exactly obvious why producing this data was going to actually help make things more understandable. And it's just one particular example of a, of a number of cases where exactly that's what would happen with the producing of the data. Would you go for, so far as to say that this would damage the public's confidence in an institution in a, you know, in, in a situation where it didn't deserve to be damaged in this case? Well, it would, it would damage it to some degree. I don't think it would be a significant damage in the, pun, in the punch clock example. Um, I do think that, um, that the money in politics example, more generally in the United States, though, is quite serious um, for the institution of Congress. I think you know, in the polling that we did in my district in California, literally 88% of people believed money buys results in Congress. Uh, which means that they're extraordinarily cynical about what Congress does. 22% of the American public have a favorable view of Congress. There were more people who supported the British crown at the time of the revolution than support our Congress today. And that's because people think that there is this deep uh, corruption inside the system. Uh, and part of the, what feeds that is all these reports of money that goes into politics. Now, again, I don't think we can get rid of those reports. I think those reports are important and necessary. What I think we should do to eliminate the cynicism is change the way elections get funded so that uh, people don't believe that it's money driving the results. You know, before we go any further, I should check and see whether or not you are still a member of that Sunlight Foundation. Are you still on the board there? I, well, I was only ever on the advisory board, and they haven't fired me yet, so I think I still am. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to wonder. With the piece that you wrote and, and obviously going against the, the punch clock campaign, are you expecting to be kicked off anytime soon? I would be surprised if I were kicked off. You know, I have enormous respect for the Sunlight Foundation. There's, no, in, there's not one line in the, in the essay that's, that's, that criticizes the foundation. Um, and I would think uh, any foundation would encourage lots of... Uh, uh, debate around around the particular issue. You know, they brought me on the board, the board to be advisory, uh, and and that's what I'm doing. But but again, you know, nothing that I'm saying necessarily says that what they're doing is wrong. What I'm saying is that people have to recognize we need to do two things, not one. We need transparency plus a fundamental change in the way the system functions. And people who think that transparency alone is going to get us to um, a democracy that we can be proud of, I think, are just fooling themselves. And that, that was the point of the piece. Well, while I did indeed read all 6,000 words of your piece, we're not going to put all 6,000 words on this program tonight. But we will read this little excerpt here just to give people a better sense of what you had to say. How could anyone, you write, be against transparency? Its virtues and its utilities seem so crushingly obvious. But I have increasingly come to worry that there is an error at the core of this unquestioned goodness. We are not thinking critically enough about where and when transparency works and where and when it may lead to confusion, or to worse. 
and I fear that the inevitable success of this movement, if pursued alone, without any sensitivity to the full complexity of the idea of perfect openness, will inspire not reform, but disgust. The naked transparency movement, as I will call it here, is not going to inspire change. It will simply push any faith in our political system over the cliff. And again, just to clarify, the naked transparency system you talk about, you want to tell us what that's a reference to? Yeah, the naked transparency movement, I, I mean, is the movement that just is pursuing transparency. So in that quote that you just gave, I said that the tra uh, transparency movement, if pursued alone, meaning if you're not pursuing it along with trying to change the way campaigns are getting funded. You know, there was a very famous politician in San Francisco called Harvey Milk, who was one of the first gay politicians to get uh, uh, into government in San Francisco, and he had a very famous line, you got to give him hope. Well, that's the point here, right? If all you do is you show people that Congress is corrupt, at a certain point, people are going to say, to hell with it. I'm just going to go back to my, you know, taking care of my kids. I'm not going to worry about politics. you got to give them a picture of how things could be different and how it could be that you wouldn't think that, your mon that money was buying the result of your congressman. So that's why I'm talking about transparency pursuit alone without confronting the fact that we actually have a much more difficult, fundamental political battle to have here about introducing public funding into uh, elections in the United States the way, you know, obviously in, in most advanced democracies there's something like this functioning right now. Well, we did refer earlier to the fact that you did get a considerable amount of reaction to your piece in the New Republic, and in fact the magazine itself uh, published a considerable amount of that reaction as well. And I want to read a couple of excerpts uh, of some of the reaction you got. This one from Tim Wu that was published a couple of days after your original piece. In his essay, Lessig does not go far enough. Naked transparency isn't the problem. It is our addiction to miracle cures that since 1788 have done little for the patient. What I mean is that many transparency systems simply create an incentive to, re to create a good impression under the dictates of the system. Just as food manufacturers manage to produce fat-free and low-calorie food that isn't necessarily healthy, politicians will produce information that suggests even-handedness even if there is none. Meanwhile, the chance of transparency cure producing real change is close to zero. Does anyone really think that posting a schedule online will make a politician into a better leader? What's your reaction to that? Well, I think Tim's right. And, um, and you know, so his point is external controls are not enough. Um, and I agree. That's why I think we also need to change the internal incentives. And the way to change the internal incentives is to make it so that a congressman is not thinking or working 30 to 70 percent of his time trying to raise money to get back to Congress. That's the way life is for a congressman here in the United States. They spend an extraordinary amount of time uh, just worrying about how to raise money for themselves or for their party. Well, if they didn't do that, if they didn't constantly think about how their vote is going to affect money that they need to raise to get back into Congress, then maybe they could make judgments that actually resonated better with the views of the people in their district. Yes, so I, I agree with him. We need two changes together. That's a bit off topic, but, you know, it's a two-year term. Do you, think, um, do you think if they lengthen the term to, say, four or six years, as they, as they have in the Senate, six years, uh, you wouldn't have to have public funding of campaigns, and they wouldn't be so obsessed about raising money the day after they got elected? Well, senators are in exactly the same position. A senator, the day after he's elected, the campaign uh, committee chairman will tell him he's got to start getting on the phones right that minute, raising literally tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, right in the first months of uh, uh, his tenure. Um, so it's the same problem on both sides. Uh, and in the Senate, of course, what we see is the only people who get to run um, are those who have leveraged that power, like uh, Max Baucus, who is I think grotesque in the, you know, this is a guy from Montana, represents 0.3% of the American population, but is perhaps the most important person in the Senate controlling what health care looks like, and, and has just opened up his coffers and has accepted more than $4 million in contributions from uh, health care industry and doctors and other people being affected by these regulations that he's in charge of. Um, you know, he uh, grotesquely takes advantage of this system to, uh, to get an extraordinary amount of power, and and it's that kind of behavior that I think leads people rightly to believe that it's not the right answer that's, per that's governing what Congress does. It's the answer that produces the most dollars. Okay, let me get us back with uh, some more reaction from the New Republic. This was from a piece by Ellen Miller and Michael Klein. And here's the excerpt. The current transparency movement actually is quite different from the naked transparency straw man Lessig creates and attacks in his essay. We do not believe in solely releasing data and then reaping the whirlwind. We and our colleagues spend most of our efforts creating tools and sites to help draw meaning from the information we help put online. 
The reality of Washington is that far too much of our nation's business is still hidden from public view, that much of our great commonwealth is wasted by cronyism and venality, and that the public's regard for the institutions of government is, as a result, sadly already where Lessig says he is afraid it will go. Improved transparency is not a threat to public trust. It is the very basis for restoring that trust. We do seem to have more information available to more people in more ways than ever before. I guess my question, though, is, is the quantity and the variety creating more confusion than clarity nowadays, in your view? In some cases, I think it is. I mean, the comment that you just read by Ellen Miller and Michael Klein, I think, you know, is just not reading carefully what I said. Obviously, I said, uh, you know, right in the very beginning, quote, without a doubt, the vast majority of these transparency projects make sense. Um, in, but instead, I was talking about a very narrow class. Um, and when they say that they try to teach people how to draw meaning from it, the point is there is no meaning to be drawn from it. So while I believe there is no doubt that when Congress takes hundreds of millions of dollars from uh, you know, the healthcare care industry, that's affecting how Congress legislates in health care. You can't infer from any particular contribution given to a congressperson that he or she changed uh, their vote because of this contribution. There's just not, there's no amount of data that could tell you that. And no amount of massaging or instruction by Ellen Miller at the Sunlight Foundation is going to inform people of that. So the point is not that they don't do a great job where they're trying to make people understand the data that can be made understandable. I think they're doing a fantastic job. The point is there's a class of data that is inherently ambiguous and will and people will draw inferences from it that uh, they can't meaningfully draw. And the only way to minimize the harm from that is not, as they suggest I say later, to eliminate the data. It's instead to eliminate the underlying evil, which is the potential that influence is actually being bought. Let's do one more example here. And since you just mentioned Max Baucus and the work he's doing on the Finance Committee to try and get that health care bill forward, let's stick with that one. Do you not think it would be useful to have a huge new database in which you would find what doctors in the United States or what politicians in the United States took large financial contributions from, for example, very rich HMOs or very rich players in the healthcare field and seeing how that played out along the way. How did those politicians vote? How did those doctors practice medicine? What drugs did they prescribe? Would that be useful to have that information online somewhere? Well. If the choice is the existing system without that information or the existing system with that information, I certainly want that information with the existing system because I want the ability to point out how there's a significant fear that money is buying results here. But what I want to do with that information is to push the system towards the result where we don't have to worry about that because, in fact, money is not being uh, used to buy Congress people. Money is instead being used for other purposes, and the Congress people get elected through public funding. So obviously, I want the data. That's why I sit on the board of the Maplite organization, which is, I think, the very best organization drawing exactly these links, because I want to produce this data for the purpose of producing a movement to drive change in the way elections get funded. Now, the drug database issue is a much more complicated one. Because, of course, that's exactly what's happening. And the health care bill will include a requirement of this kind of database nationally. Um, but I think what many people are recognizing is when you actually get the data, you know, when you actually read that your doctor has done x and y, what are you supposed to do with it? What does it mean? Um, does it, do you, are you supposed to think that the doctor is uh, corrupted by that? Um, um, are you supposed to believe in it more? And there's some uh, research that suggests that, in fact, disclosing in that context uh, actually uh, um, causes more harm than good because when you disclose, the doctor feels, oh, I've disclosed, so all bets are off. I can do what I want. And the patient thinks, boy, he's pretty honest. He's told me about all his conflicts, so I must really, uh, he must be a really honest guy. I should trust him more. So there's a perverse effect from the disclosure in that context. Now, again, I don't think you know, it's possible to imagine to go back in the dark ages, and I don't think we should. But instead, I think we need to learn to live with the consequences of transparency and learn to, th and to think about how we can adjust the system so that the harmful consequences can get outweighed by the good consequences from transparent systems. Understood. Lawrence Lestig, it's good of you to join us on the line from Boston tonight. Thanks so much. Very happy to be here. Thank you.